Buonasera, buonasera a tutti, grazie di essere qui per questa occasione così speciale con i nostri ospiti, il professor Attilio Ferrari che è presidente di Infinito e del Museo dell'Astronomia e dello Spazio di Pino Torinese e la nostra ospite d'onore di questa sera, la professoressa Jocelyne Bell Burnell. Um, devo dire che è un grande onore avere eh, una scienziata così importante e così illustre. Eh, lasciatemi dire che in tempi come questi dove non c'è molto amore per la scienza e spesso dobbiamo eh, fronteggiare, io lo vedo come giornalista della stampa, eh, tante fake news eh, antiscientifiche, ehm, poter incontrare questa sera una, una vera scienziata come la professoressa Abel Bernel è un'occasione davvero, davvero speciale, eh, perché lei ci racconterà che cosa significa essere uno scienziato, cosa significa fare ricerca e fare scoperta. E scoprirete anche, attraverso le sue parole, credo, una persona non solo intelligente e creativa, ma anche molto generosa, perché come... Eh, non è stato raccontato da questo breve e bellissimo video, ma probabilmente molti di voi sanno che la professoressa ha deciso di donare eh, l'intero premio Breakthrough di 3 milioni di dollari a una fondazione no profit che destinerà questi soldi a giovani studenti, in particolare studentesse, a minoranze etniche, a rifugiati, a profughi, a tutte quelle persone diciamo così, che sono sfavorite eh, nello studio e nella ricerca. Quindi è una persona speciale non solo per le sue qualità intellettuali, ma anche per la sua generosità e per il suo cuore. E quindi... E a conferma di questo, eh, questa serata eh, conclude una giornata molto intensa della professoressa che è cominciata questa mattina all'Osservatorio di Pino Torinese con la terza edizione dell'Astronomy Day che eh, noi con la, della stampa abbiamo il piacere di organizzare con Infinito, con l'Università, con l'INFN, con l'INAF e che ha proprio uno scopo che in qualche modo intercetta anche quella generosità di cui vi parlavo della professoressa. Vale a dire, abbiamo voluto mobilitare un po' di studenti delle scuole superiori, eh, che sono arrivati numerosissimi, oltre 200, più 30 classi che si sono collegate in streaming da tutta Italia, e quindi questa mattina hanno potuto sentire una, una lezione di fisica e di astronomia dalla professoressa, e quindi speriamo che questa lezione possa aver acceso anche delle scintille di curiosità e, e di amore per la scienza fra le nuove generazioni e quindi in qualche modo che speriamo che quel testimone che la professoressa ha afferrato 50 anni fa quando scoprì le pulsar ancora da studentessa perché lei era una dottoranda poi diciamo idealmente questo testimone continui per le nuove generazioni, sapendo che in fondo abbiamo di fronte un periodo di scoperte straordinarie. Ve lo racconterà il professor Ferrari, eh, molte delle scoperte recenti di questi anni, comprese le onde gravitazionali, hanno in qualche modo una radice lontana che nasce proprio dalla scoperta delle pulsar della professoressa. Quindi stasera... Abbiamo un'occasione speciale, lascio la parola al professor Ferrari e poi alla professoressa. Prego. Grazie. Beh, devo dire che quando abbiamo incominciato a pensare di celebrare i 50 anni della Pulsar, Uh, mi sono guardato indietro perché anch'io ho vissuto sostanzialmente questi 50 anni di uh, sviluppo dell'astronomia che è incominciata appunto 50 anni fa con, la, con una vera nascita della radioastronomia innanzitutto 
e che appunto eh, ha avuto slancio sia per le osservazioni dei quasar su cui la dottoressa Bella ha fatto la tesi e che ha portato in un modo con una certa sorpresa alla scoperta anche delle, delle pulsar. No? Eh, e diciamo in questi 50 anni che io ho vissuto, no? oramai io so, sono un po' più vecchio della, della dottoressa Bell, eh, eh, diciamo, ho vissuto anch'io questo momento come dire, travolgente no? di sviluppi e di, di, nuovi, di nuove scoperte. Eh, 50 anni fa non avevamo praticamente eh, ancora neanche chiaro Uh, come si potessero avere informazioni di tipo cosmologico, tanto per dire, no? la cosmologia è nata più o meno anche in quegli anni, con le prime osservazioni della radiazione di fondo. Oggi, quando si dice che uh, l'universo è vecchio 13.7 miliardi di anni, no? uh, oramai ci crediamo tutti, no? almeno l'inizio dell'universo, il momento dal Big Bang, insomma, poi che cosa sia stato il Big Bang e cosa ci fosse prima, è ancora un altro discorso. Ma soprattutto abbiamo sviluppato tutta quella che oggi chiamiamo l'astrofisica delle alte energie, cioè eh, l'osservazione e informazioni sui raggi cosmici, è nata anche proprio eh, attraverso alla spinta della scoperta delle pulsar è nata tutta l'astronomia X e l'astronomia Gamma che in questi ultimi anni hanno dato, ci hanno dato la possibilità di osservare eh, il, diciamo, le fasi più attive dell'universo, le fasi in cui gli oggetti cambiano, quegli oggetti celesti che in passato gli antichi pensavano che fossero eterni, immutabili, perfetti eccetera e che invece oggi sappiamo che cambiano, evolvono come evolviamo tutti noi, su tempi scala un pochettino diversi, ma... e eh, diciamo gli ultimi risultati che stanno venendo fuori proprio in questi giorni sono quelli relativi alle osservazioni delle onde gravitazionali che qualche anno fa abbiamo proprio celebrato anche qui a Torino quando era venuto il premio Nobel Kip Thorne che eh, diciamo era comparso prima in questi filmati. Eh, e ultimamente sta diventando possibile anche osservare quelle altre particelle che si chiamano neutrini, no? che riescono eh, ad attraversare eh, tutto l'universo alla velocità della luce e a portarci delle informazioni di nuovo su eventi di altissima energia. Quindi è stato un cambiamento sostanziale. E bisogna veramente dire, in questo senso è giusta la parola, del breakthrough prize dato alla, alla dottoressa Bell, cioè il premio per il punto di svolta, perché fino a quel momento eh, sostanzialmente non avevamo assolutamente idea di come andare a guardare, di che, che fosse possibile addirittura andare a guardare gli oggetti all'inizio, eh, alla fine dell'evoluzione dell dell delle stelle e di conseguenza anche per studiare eh, poi le microonde, diciamo, l'inizio dell'universo e oggi tutto quello che si chiama astronomia gamma. Quindi dobbiamo ringraziare la dottoressa Bell per essere riuscita a convincere il professor Jewish, il suo, il suo, i professori sono bravi ma a volte hanno bisogno di, di essere come dire, eh, stimolati no? dai, dai loro studenti, no? quindi se molti di voi, so, essendo molti di voi giovani, no? se avete a che fare con, con i vostri professori Trattateli bene, no? non è il caso di trattarli male, però se siete convinti che qualcosa è giusto, lottate e cercate di convincere che avete ragione. E in effetti eh, è quello che ci racconterà la dottoressa Bell adesso, eh, cioè il, il, diciamo, il lavoro no? che lei ha fatto in quel periodo e che ha, ripeto, portato a questa enorme svolta. Lei ha avuto questo Special Breakthrough Prize, che è un, come vi, forse vi racconterà, no? una cosa quasi hollywoodiana quando viene premiata, no? però, perché lo si fa a San Francisco, ci sono di mezzo, eh, c'è Google, eh, Facebook, tutte queste mm. compagnie, artisti, eccetera, eccetera, no? con musica e altre cose, è una cosa trionfale, è il premio più grande che ci sia, no? eh, in un certo senso, oramai i premi Nobel sono quasi 
eh, sono una cosa quasi vecchia, insomma, no? eh, questo è, è, è veramente appassionante. E in particolare questo che lei ha ricevuto è proprio questo special, cioè la parola special davanti al breakthrough prize, che è quello più significativo, più importante, ed è un breakthrough nel vero senso della parola, come adesso io vi ho detto qualche cosa, ma come vi spiegherà meglio la dottoressa Belli. Quindi eh, invito tutti, ripeto, gli studenti a impegnarsi e a anche a credere alle cose che vedono eh, sui dati no? e non lasciarsi intimorire dal, dal, dall'ambiente, dal sistema. Bene, io lascerei la parola alla dottoressa Bell. Good evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you to all of you for coming. Tonight I am going to tell a story, a 50-year-old story, about the discovery of pulsars. I will first say a little bit about radio astronomy. Aha, it does not work. About radio astronomy. I will then say a little bit about quasars. Then about being in Cambridge and discovering pulsars. And finally tell you a little bit what pulsars are. With our eyes, we can see this little bit of the whole family of light, the electromagnetic spectrum. We now know that stars and galaxies give us gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, ordinary light, infrared, millimeter and radio waves. And this story is about studying the stars with radio waves, radio astronomy. This is a photograph of one of the biggest, earliest radio telescopes. It's in Britain. It's called Jodrell Bank. Radio astronomy developed after the World War. During the World War, World War II, radar was developed. And at the end of the war, the people who had developed radar, some of them, went back to universities and started radio astronomy, using the equipment they had for receiving radar signals. They did not want to send signals, they just wanted to receive. And radio astronomy, which receives radio waves from stars and galaxies, came out of that and that technology. So the early radio astronomers turned their telescopes to the sky and found a lot of radio emitting things in the sky. Some of them looked like stars when astronomers turned their telescopes to those spots in the sky. They were star-like or quasi-stellar and they became known as quasi-stellar radio sources, or quasars for short. It turned out that they were very, very distant, but they were also strong. You expect strong sources to be nearby, but these were very, very distant, so they must have been ultra-strong close to the source. And uh, we now call them quasars. So, just a little bit of my history, because I think it's part of the story. I started life in the north of Ireland, here. I went to school here. I did my first degree in Glasgow, here. And then, Somehow, perhaps by mistake, I find myself away down in the south, 
in Cambridge. Now, you can find all that on a map. This you cannot find on a map. In Britain, there is the feeling that down here is very civilized. And up here, whoa, savages. <laughs> Uncouth savages. I don't know if there's the same sort of gradient in Italy, in Torino, uncouth savages, and in Sicily, ultimate civilization. I don't know. <laughs> but I come from here, find myself down here, and I feel very much from the country. So, in Cambridge, I find everybody is very confident and very suave and very clever and very keen that you know that they are clever. I think, wow, oh, I'm not so clever. They've made a mistake admitting me. They're going to discover their mistake and they're going to throw me out. We now know that this happens for many people, it's called imposter syndrome. And when we work in prestigious universities, like Oxford, where I am now, we know to watch out for students who are feeling, oh, they've made a mistake, they're going to throw me out. We look out for those students and we support them and encourage them. However, what I did was, I said, they're going to throw me out. But until they throw me out, I will work my very hardest so that when they throw me out, I will not have a guilty conscience. I'll know I've done my best and I'm just not clever enough for Cambridge. So I was working very, very hard. I love this quotation. It comes from a Russian. It's actually said about cosmologists, but it sums up Cambridge beautifully. Frequently in error, but never in doubt. You might find that a useful quote sometimes. When I arrived in Cambridge, the first thing that happened was I was given some tools. These are not microelectronics tools. These are heavy-duty wire working tools. Because a lot of my job, indeed my whole job, over the next two years was to help building a radio telescope in an empty field. This is a photograph taken near the end. It shows that we work in the field. We have here some very special cables. I have been putting the sockets on the end, and now we're checking that the connections are good. Uh, we have a slotted waveguide here, and we're checking the impedance. And we are working literally in the field. This is the finished radio telescope. It looks homemade. It is homemade. <laughs> there are 2,048 antennae. Um, it covers an area of 1.8 hectares. There's 192 kilometers of wire and cable. It's big. Um, this area is like 57 tennis courts, so it is really big. It's got large, large collecting area. It will pick up very faint radio sources. It is sensitive. Uh, we were still using valves. I had used transistors in Glasgow as an undergraduate when I came to Cambridge and said, 
You still using valves? Why not transistors? Whoa, transistors are unreliable. Oh, transistors are noisy. We use valves. <laughs> they did ultimately change, but this was with valves. Now, to explain what this telescope had to do, we are concerned with finding more of these very strong, very distant objects called quasars. So there is a quasar somewhere away, way, way up, up there, and the radio wave comes down towards the radio telescope, which is here on the ground. It comes through the space between the sun and the planets, the interplanetary space. And that is not empty, because there is a wind coming from the sun that fills the space between the sun and planets. That wind, the solar wind, is not perfectly smooth. There are some clouds in it clouds with extra electrons. And when the radio wave comes down through these clouds, it gets bent in many directions. The clouds blow past, and the radio telescope picks up a signal that changes in brightness quite fast. This is just one second. For other kinds of radio sources, they are much broader than quasars, and there are many rays coming down, going through several clouds and several gaps. And so as the clouds go past, there is not the same fluctuation. It is steady. So if you want to find quasars, you look for something whose strength appears to change a lot. And to see those changes, you must have short integration times, short accumulation times. It's a bit like, not exactly like, but a bit like the pattern that you get on the bottom of a swimming pool when the sun is shining. You get these bright and dark patches and if you were to lie on the bottom of the swimming pool, looking at the sun, you would see the bright and the dark passing in front of you. Similarly, here, the bright and the dark and the bright and the dark and the bright. At the time I started, there were only about 20 quasars known. And we really needed to find more many more. So the project was to build this big radio telescope, to look for the objects in the sky that went bright and faint and bright and faint, that changed in brightness, and those would be the quasars. We were to pick them out because of their rapid twinkling. And uh, having built the telescope, I used it for six months and I found about 180 more quasars. So we went from 20 quasars to 200 quasars, which is much better. At that time, in the University of Cambridge, there was one computer in the whole university, and it had less memory than your laptop, and very few people could use it. The head of the radio astronomy group, he had time on the computer because he was mapping the sky and had to do Fourier transforms. That's quite difficult by hand. So he had time on the computer. But every other academic had graduate students instead of computers. And our data came out on paper chart. Kilometers and kilometers of paper chart. Each day I got 30 meters. We took four days to scan the sky, 
so 120 meters to scan the sky, and by the end of six months, I had five and a quarter kilometers of paper chart. I quickly got used to recognizing the quasars. I also quickly got used to recognizing interference, radio signals produced by things, equipment on Earth. Today, radio astronomers will pick up your mobile phone, your digital camera, some microwave ovens, maybe, anything that sparks, arc welders, for instance, give radio emission. And because our radio telescopes are very sensitive, they pick these things up. And so, along with the quasars, I got used to recognizing this interference, as we call it. But I was the first person to use this radio telescope. I was making sure that it was working properly and that I understood it thoroughly. And so I was checking everything. And this is the first instance of a signal that I could not understand. This turns out to be the first observation of a pulsar. This is some interference, low-level interference, not too strong, but still there. And somehow, to me, this did not look the same as that. And I think I maybe logged it with a question mark, but it also stuck in my brain because your brain will, well, particularly if you trained in physics, your brain will store things that you do not understand. Now, it wasn't always there. It mostly was not there. It was there about 20% of the time that we looked at that bit of sky. But after some weeks of scanning all these charts, my brain said, you've seen something like that before, haven't you? You've seen something like that before from that bit of sky, haven't you? And then it's easy. After finishing the charts, I roll them up and I put them in shoe boxes. And each shoe box is for a different strip of the sky. So I find the shoe box for this strip of the sky I get out, out, get out all the charts, and you need a lot of floor space, but you spread out a chart, and 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 you line them all up. So here's this one. It wasn't there. It wasn't there. Oh, yeah, I saw that one. I logged that one with a question mark. No, yeah. no. Yeah. Might be there. I didn't notice that one. No, no, no. It was there. That was the first time I saw it. And they're all at the same time. Now, this time that I'm working with is not our human time. It's the time that the stars keep. You perhaps know that in the night sky, in winter, there are different constellations from the night sky in summer. That's because the stars go round in 23 hours and 56 minutes, not 24 hours, 23 hours, 56. The stars get four minutes earlier every day. And this is the 23 hour, 56 minute star day sidereal time. So this signal, when it's there, is at the same place amongst the stars. I showed this to my thesis advisor, who said, yeah, that is five millimeters. That's too little. We cannot see what is happening. We need an expansion, an enlargement. With paper charts, it's easy. To get an enlargement, you move the paper faster under the pen, and everything gets spread out. So, OK, we just run the chart recorders at high speed. 
Mm -mm. If we run the chart recorders at high speed, it runs out of paper in 20 minutes. Guess who lives at the observatory putting a fresh roll of paper in every 20 minutes? The student. <laughs> Not a good idea. Next best idea, the student goes out to the observatory at this time, switches to high speed, switches back to normal speed at that time, and we have this little bit at high speed. So I did that for one day, two days, three days, one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, no signal. I made high-speed recordings of this receiver noise, this rubbish, no signal. My thesis advisor was very cross. It was a flare star. It's been and gone and done it and you've missed it. Maybe there are some graduate students in the audience. Maybe some of you have been graduate students. You know that graduate students are like the cat. They are for kicking when you are cross. <laughs> Finally, after a month, I got a signal. And this is the first signal. So, pulse, pulse, mm mm. Pulse, 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 back on beat. Even when the pulse gets too weak to see, it keeps the beat, it keeps phase. Along the bottom are one second time marks, and so you can see it's taking about one and one third seconds each pulse. I wasn't quite sure what this was, so I called up when, when the observation was over, when the sky had turned and the, the object had gone away for the day. I phoned Tony, my supervisor, and said, Tony, you know that funny signal? It's a string of pulses, one and one third seconds apart. Ah, that settles it. It's man-made could not envisage anything in the stars. Well, he had to go away to teach. I knew it was not man-made, because when it was there, it was coming from the same point amongst the stars, the 23-hour, 56-minute day. If this was Antonio going home from work in a badly suppressed car, Antonio is getting off work four minutes earlier every day, 28 minutes a week, and this has been going on for several months. <laughs> it's not human made. It doesn't keep the 24-hour clock. Tony took away all my records and finally agreed with me that it was keeping its place amongst the stars and I continued to go out each day to get this kind of recording. And we could see that the period was not changing. So, it's very hard to explain, it's very hard to understand. Could it be there's local radio interference? No, because it keeps its place amongst the stars. Jocelyn has wired the radio telescope up wrong. That's the problem. So we get another radio telescope with its own receiver to see if they can see the signal. And I remember that vividly. Um, my telescope saw it first, and then the other telescope was to see it five minutes later. And on that day, it was pulsing quite well. I could see it with my telescope. So then we went and we stood by the chart recorder for the other telescope and nothing happened. So my supervisor and the supervisor on this project started walking down this very long laboratory. What could it be that shows in 
hers, but not this one. Could it be? No, no, it can't be that. I wonder if, no, it won't work. Could it? No, no. And I was walking along behind them, trying to keep up in every sense of the word. And Robin, the grad student with the other telescope, stayed by his pen recorder. And we got down the end of this long laboratory, and there was a shriek, here it is! And we went charging back up. We had miscalculated by five minutes when the second telescope would see it. If we had miscalculated by 25 minutes, we would all have gone home and the story would be different. Yes. So, it's something that's small because it gives short pulses, but it's something that's big because I've already seen it a number of days and it keeps the same pulse rate. It's not getting tired. It's not getting weak. So it must be big, big energy reserves, because it can keep pulsing and not get tired. So it's small and it's big. Mm. We subsequently learned to be more precise it's small in the sense it's not very wide, it's small. But it's big in the sense that it's very heavy. It has lots of energy reserves. And now we understand that. But at the time it was quite difficult to understand. A colleague got an estimate of how far away the signal was and he said it's 200 light years away which means it's beyond the Sun and the planets, but it's still within the Milky Way galaxy. Tony, my supervisor, was still a little bit worried that it was man-made, that it was artificial. So he wondered if it was little green men. Little green men or an alien civilization I'm just going to borrow these for a demonstration. Here's a planet with some little green men on it. Here is their sun. Their planet goes round their sun. You are the radio astronomers. And when the planet is coming towards you, the pulses pile up closer. And when the planet is moving away from you, they're more stretched out. This is called Doppler shift. You also see it um, quite often in everyday life. So now I am a small child and I have a racing car and I go, Nyaw! you see the ah, oh, the change in pitch, ah, because the pulses pile up and oh, because the pulses separate out. So, we kept observing, looking for this change in the pulse period, in the frequency, in the spacing between the pulses. It's called a Doppler shift. And we found a Doppler shift. But it's due to the motion of the Earth round the Sun. Because as the Earth moves towards the little green men or whatever, the pulses get closer and as the Earth moves away from the little green men, the pulses get further apart. So we'd proved that the Earth went round the Sun, but we weren't doing much other than that. And then I kept observing, looking for the quasars, making more observations of the pulsars. And just before Christmas, I went to ask Tony something downstairs in his office, and I found there was a top-level meeting going on, a discussion about how we publish this. We have one of these pulsing sources, and only one. It's very peculiar. It is almost impossible to publish one peculiar result. But we really ought to be publishing it. We didn't solve the problem that evening. I went home for some supper, came back in late at night to do some more analysis of these charts, 
because I now had kilometers and kilometers of this chart paper that needed analyzing. The lab shut at 10 o'clock at night. The janitor locked the doors. The students did not have keys. So you could be locked in or locked out. And about five minutes before lock-up time, I was analyzing a totally different bit of the sky. Uh oh, what's that? That looks very like that first one. Oh dear, right, okay, that's declination. Find the shoebox, throw the charts out, line them up roughly. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. No. And this one, they line up. That bit of sky will be seen by the telescope at two o'clock in the morning. I have to be there. So throw the charts on the desk and run out as the janitor is locking the doors behind me and go out to the observatory at two o'clock in the morning. And it's very cold, December the 21st, and in cold weather, sometimes it didn't work properly. And it wasn't working properly. So I thumped the equipment on <gasps> to warm it up, and I flicked switches, and I cursed it, and I got it to work on the right setting for the right five minutes, and in came Pulse, 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 pulse. The first ones were one and one third seconds. This was one and a quarter seconds. It's another one from the same family. It has to be. And it's not little green men. There aren't two lots of little green men, both signaling to Earth. Why? At 81.5 megahertz. Why? Using amplitude modulation. Why? It has to be a new kind of star. I went away for Christmas, much happier, having left Tony a message. Tony kept the observations running. He put chart paper in the recorders, ink in the ink wells, and piled the records unanalyzed on my desk. And when I came back after Christmas, there was a pile of records on my desk. Tony was in a meeting. So I sat down to do some more of this chart analysis. I was working through it and said, oh yes, which one's that? It's not either. It must, it's not either. It's a third one. Wow. Okay, I'll just finish this chart and then I'll come back and check up on this. So pass on. What? Too much alcohol at Christmas. Two of them, a metre apart? Gee. At that point, Tony arrives and stands at the end of my desk. Tony, Tony, look. Oh, Happy New Year, Tony. Thank you for keeping the survey good. Look, look at this. Huh. How many more have you missed? Go back through all your old records. Kilometres of it. <laughs> So ultimately, the third and the fourth were confirmed just a few weeks later. This one was rather exciting. It had a rather faster period and could occasionally be very, very strong. And it became a tourist attraction for other graduate students. Jocelyn, when is 0950 transiting? They wanted to go out to the observatory to see a chart recorder pen go bung, 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 four times a second and hitting the end stops. It was quite a sight. So we now have four and we can publish and that's great. Fairly soon after that, I stopped observing. I only had six months more money. I had to finish the chart analysis. I had to write a thesis and so on. When the uh, paper announcing the first one was published, there was enormous press interest. And the press interviews took a fairly predictable format. There would be Tony and I. And apologies to La Stampa, you did not do this today. 
Um, but back then, they would ask Tony about the astrophysical significance of this discovery, and Tony would tell them. And then they'd turn to me for what they called the human interest. What were my vital statistics? How tall was I? How many boyfriends did I have? The photographer wanted me to undo some buttons. It was really, really horrible. And I would have loved to have been very rude to those journalists. But I'm a graduate student. I haven't even written my thesis, let alone finished my PhD. I need references for jobs. I couldn't be rude to them, but I would have loved to have been. So that was unhappy. But one journalist from a paper called the Daily Telegraph, Anthony Michaelis, asked, what are you going to call these things? We had been calling them pulsating radio sources. Um, we wondered whether we should call them pulsed radio sources, but pulsed implies little green men making the pulses, whereas pulsating sounds more natural. But he said, you need a short name. So he suggested the word pulsar, which is a bit like quasar. And he published that in the Daily Telegraph. Since then, the watch company has taken the name. And in Britain, at least, Nissan cars have a model called pulsars. In the United States, the watch company tried suing the radio astronomers for use of the name. <laughs> so, what do we now understand about these objects? For this, I will be giving just an overview, not too much detail. So, we have a very, very compact star, about 10 kilometers radius, that is spinning, and from its magnetic poles come these two cones of radio waves. And when the cone shines in our eyes, we get a pulse. The other one misses us, but next time round, a pulse. And the other one misses us, and next time round, we get a pulse. In slightly more detail, here's the, the star. It is a solid star. So there's the spin axis. Here's north magnetic pole, south magnetic pole, magnetic field lines. And somehow, we don't yet fully understand how, from near the poles there comes out a beam of radio waves. And the beam sweeps around the sky, like a lighthouse shines a beam around the horizon. They're very small objects, very dense. Um, they are rich in a particle called neutrons, so they're called neutron stars. They've got very strong gravitational fields, very strong electric magnetic fields, they spin rapidly. The physics is very extreme. They're probably formed in the explosion that ends the life of a big star, an explosion called a supernova. Um, and mostly they're seen by the radio astronomers as these pulse sources. And let's see if this link will work for me. No, that one won't. Um, I think I need to go into the full view. Go down on that one. Missing the mouse pointer. Okay, let's see. It's okay. So that's a pulsar pulsing several times a second. You hear the bup 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 bup. It's spinning it up, 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 up. It's really going quite fast. Um, yeah. So these things are mainly radio astronomy objects. 
We now know almost 3,000, most of them in the radio, a few visible, a few X-ray, quite a lot in gamma rays, surprisingly. And most of them are isolated, single stars, but some are in a binary. Um, and one of them, both stars are a pulsar, and that's the one that was discovered um, here in, well, by Italians, by Marta Borghe, uh, Nico D'Amico, and I've forgotten who the third one is, but it's a very, very special binary, that one, and is very good for testing Einstein's theories. We have one in a triple system, and we have a few with planets, which is curious. And there are about 10,000, probably, in the galaxy. They come about when a very big star, 100 times the mass of the sun, gets to the end of its life. And the star explodes, the core of the star collapses, and becomes one of these objects. They're called supernovae. So this is a photograph of a patch of the sky before the event, there's a star here picked out with an arrow. The arrow is added after the photograph's taken. <laughs> and this is the explosion. And the center of that star will have collapsed to make one of these neutron stars. The most famous one is what's called the Crab Nebula in the constellation of Taurus. It's an explosion that happened about a thousand years ago, a bit more than that now. And we now know that there is a pulsar right there in the middle of this nebula. So just a little bit more about their properties. Uh, they weigh a few times this, which is a few thousand million, 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 million tons. And all that material is in a ball with radius 10 kilometers. So it's very dense. It's dense like the nucleus of the atom. And these things are called neutron stars because they are rich in the particles called neutrons. To help you understand the density, take a sewing thimble, you know, a nice silver sewing thimble. Take the population of the world and squeeze them into the thimble. All seven billion people on Earth. And when you have all seven billion in that thimble, it weighs as much as if it were filled with material from one of these stars. They are really, really dense. A consequence of this density is strong gravity, tidal effects, and some very extreme physics. The strong gravity bends light. So if I was standing on one of these stars, I could see over the horizon. 20 or 30 degrees over the horizon. I could see two-thirds of the star without moving my feet. Must feel very peculiar. Gravity also redshifts light. So if there are little green men on one of these stars, to us they look like little red men. And the gravity also affects clocks. A clock on the surface of one of these stars will do one tick every two seconds instead of one tick every second. There's also a very strong gradient of gravity. So suppose this is one of these neutron stars and I'm coming in to land and I'm coming in feet first because that's the ladylike way to land on one of these stars. Then as I come in to land, the gravity on my feet is much stronger than the gravity on my head. And it makes my body go long and thin. Indeed, it pulls my body apart. First it pulls the feet off and they go clunk 
onto the surface. And then your legs, your upper legs, bits of body fall onto the surface because your body has been ripped apart. The technical name is tidal disruption. But don't go visit a pulsar. <laughs> There's a very, very strong magnet. To put that in context, your fridge magnet, if you have a fridge magnet, is one hundredth of a Tesla. These things are a hundred million Tesla. And uh, if you're an experimental scientist and you have a lab magnet of 10 Tesla, you're quite proud of that. But these are many, many, many times bigger. When you spin a large magnetic field, you get a large voltage. So we can have voltage drops up to 10 billion volts per centimeter. These are lethal. So combination of strong electric and magnetic fields actually means that the electromagnetic forces are even much stronger than the gravitational forces, which I was talking about a moment ago. They're very good, accurate timekeepers because once you get that mass spinning, it keeps spinning. And it's very difficult to make it change its spin. It just goes round and round and round and round and round and round forever. So it's a good clock. The typical pulsar, the period has increased by about one second since the age of the dinosaurs, 85 million years. They're very good clocks. And now we have, thank you nature, we have clocks, accurate clocks, dotted throughout the galaxy. And we're using these accurate clocks to test Einstein's theories of relativity. They are so good. The future looks really, really exciting. Uh, there's a very big new radio telescope being built in China. It's just about finished. It is 500 meters across, half a kilometer. It will pick up lots of radio waves from faint pulsars, from all sorts of faint things. It'll be a superb telescope. Um, as of about the middle of August this year, they were saying they'd found about 70 new pulsars, and it's still not fully functioning. This is just in the commissioning. So I think that's going to be very successful. They also have an intriguing statement. As well as 70 pulsars, we have found some interesting or weird sources. And we'll say no more, of course. Another thing to look out for is in Canada. It's a very new radio telescope in British Columbia, in Canada. Nice scenery in amongst the Rockies. Close up, one, two, three, four uh, mirrors side by side, making it one of the most sensitive, but also one of the best for surveying broad swathes of sky. So that'll be very good for studying pulsars. And I want to end with some pulsar records. The numbers are rather extreme. So at the center of one of these pulsars or neutron stars, the pressure is that number of times the atmospheric pressure here on Earth. It's large. The fastest known pulsar is given this designation, and it has a period of this number of milliseconds. Look at the accuracy with which it is measured. And that is not all experimental error. The period is gradually increasing, slowing. So part of that is the slowing of the period, the change in the period. And that's in milliseconds. And uh, we'll see if between us we can get this audio working.
Aha. It sounds like your kitchen blender. It's going so fast. 700 hertz, so you don't hear the individual pulses. Today we know of many planets beyond our solar system, round other stars. The first discovered were round a pulsar. So in this diagram, there's the pulsar and several other planets. The roundest known thing in the universe is the orbit of a pulsar round its companion star. It's accurate round to five microns. That's about a tenth the width of a human hair. And the orbit is almost half a million kilometers. If any of you work with conics, the eccentricity of that orbit is about 10 to the minus seven. Very, very round. And if something falls onto the surface of one of these stars, it hits the deck, traveling at half the speed of light. I don't know about you, but I find these things hard to believe in. Thank you for your interest and your attention. Grazie, grazie per essere qui. Grazie, grazie. Grazie. grazie per questa lezione davvero straordinaria. Eh, credo che in questo momento abbiate molte curiosità e molte domande e abbiamo un po' di tempo per, per soddisfarle, quindi... Abbiamo ancora un segnale di una pulsa, no? Yep. Sì, ecco, forse. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Ecco, c'era un segnale di fondo, ma questo è un segnale umano, non, non stellare. Io vedo poco, ma so che c'è una persona tra il pubblico che ha un, ha un microfono, quindi vi invito, se volete, ad approfittare per, per fare una domanda. Ecco, vedo là un, un ragazzo lassù. Prego. Grazie. Um. I would like to ask you why the period of the pulsar is so precise and doesn't get much larger in time. Like, it gets like 1.5 seconds for ages and from the time of the dinosaurs. But sh the spinning rotation, the, co the momentum of the stars shouldn't be affected by the gravity of the other orbital bodies which are close to air and shouldn't make it spin slower mm -hmm. during time. I mean, in a faster effect. Yeah. yeah, yes. It keeps spinning because it has so much mass. It has a large moment of inertia, but it basically because it has so much mass, it is just very, very difficult to stop it spinning or even to slow it up. They do very gradually slow up. We, we can see it, but it's, it's very, very slow. So these are remarkably good clocks. Prego, da questa parte, ecco, qui davanti. Qua là? 
avanti non ce n'era nulla il mezzo è difficile <ride> l'ho passato per favore Can you talk about um, the magnetar? Yes, uh, although they are quite a puzzle. Um, no, okay. I get too much feedback with... <laughs> the magnetars are things that are very like pulsars, have extremely large magnetic fields, and turn out to be quite variable in their pulsing, that their beat is okay, but the strength of the pulses changes quite a lot. Um, and and they, are, they have particularly strong magnetic fields. So they are not quite as predictable as regular pulsars, but are a very, very interesting field of study in themselves. I think we still don't fully understand what's going on there with the magnetars, because they are quite erratic in their brightness, if not in their pulsing. They can, be f they can flare, they can die, they can disappear, they can reappear, they can flare, they can die. <laughs> they do it all. Qui davanti. Ecco, sì, prego. Yeah, first of all, congratulations for the best breakthrough prize. I want to know how, given that you donate your breakthrough prize for this fellowship for graduate student. So what do you think, how much is important for you that in science, in technology, there are so much more women, much more so-called minority that represent and diversify the contribution, different point of view in science and in technology? It is now well established that in any area of work, in science, in industry, in banking, in papers, if you have a group of people that are all very alike, they are not as good as a mixed group, a diverse group, a group with maybe women and men, people with different backgrounds. That diverse group, it is harder to manage, but overall it is more successful, more flexible and more robust. And we've known about this in business for quite some time. And now we're trying in universities to ensure that we have diverse groups as well. And I think one of the reasons that I discovered Pulsars was because I was an outsider. I was bringing diversity to Cambridge. Um, it wasn't very comfortable, but because I looked at things from a different angle, maybe I saw things that other people would not see. So we now know that diversity in any working group helps that group hugely to be successful. Thank you so much for this beautiful lecture. Am I right in assuming that the roundness of the pulsar is due to the exceedingly high gravity mm -hmm. in spite of the velocity mm -hmm. with which yes. it turns? Yes. Yes, they will be a little bit oblate. They will bulge at the equator and be flatter at the poles, but only by a very little bit because their gravity is so very, very strong. Yes, that's why they're so nearly perfectly round. Good evening, and thank you so much for this splendid lesson. I just wanted to ask you something about the structure of a pulsar, because mm -hmm. I've, I've read that uh, the outer crust, if we can call it like, like that, is crystalline, and um, mm -hmm. it's actually very um, reflective, similar to a mirror. And beyond this, uh, what can we find beyond this initial crust? There are actually many different theories of what the structure is. Um, all, of course, involve very high densities. Um, my favorite model actually has an iron crust made of the metal iron. And uh, because of the very strong magnetic field, 
the iron atoms are all aligned and they make polymers, iron polymers, which has phenomenal strength, um, very good conductivity along the polymer, like copper, but like carbon across the polymer. So the electric currents flow in curious directions. That's just one model. Um, there are many. And there is still a lot of debate about exactly what they are like inside. But there is a great variety because they are 10 kilometers radius. And in going in that 10 kilometers, the density goes up by 10 orders of magnitude. So if it's 10 in some units at the outside, at the center, it's 10 to the power 10 in those units. So huge range of density, huge range of materials, shapes, structures as well. Tons of physics. <laughs> Fantastic. Ci sono altre domande? There's one over there. No. Thank you once again for the uh, fascinating lecture. Uh, I just wanted to ask, is it possible to study um, pulsars that are perfectly aligned with their spinning axis? Or Yes, if a pulsar's magnetic field and spin axis are perfectly aligned, then you will not get any pulsation. You maybe get a steady beam, we don't know, but certainly there is no pulsation. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> There's one near near the back of the echo, echo near a gangway. Good evening and thank you. I just wanted to ask, how do you think that a pulsar would react in the proximity of the black hole? Well, we have seen um, similar stars close to a black hole. We've seen black holes close to black holes. If it gets too close to the black hole, it will fall into the black hole. But if it's a little bit further out so that it doesn't immediately fall in, then we get a lot of very interesting physics because of the extreme gravity of the black hole. Uh, we need general relativity to understand it, Einstein's general relativity. And in fact, we would love to find a pulsar close to a black hole because that would be such a good test of Einstein's general relativity. Um, for those who know slightly more physics, we'll get things like frame dragging and a lot of precession, for example. So it would be really, really interesting. If you could arrange one for us, please do. Thank you very much, Professor, for your beautiful lesson and your even more beautiful uh, discovery. Just one question. Do you believe there is, uh, I would say, okay, a God, call it for uh, simplicity, behind the beauty of the universe? Do I believe in a God? Um, it, have I heard the question correctly? Exactly. Yes, okay. Um, I do not believe in a creator God. I do not believe the universe is the way it is because God turned it into that. I think physics has made the universe the way it is. But quite apart from that, um, I do believe in a God. I'm a Quaker, which is perhaps not very well known in Italy. There are some, but not many. Um, sorry? Eddington was a Quaker, yes. Arthur Stanley Eddington was a Quaker. Um, so I do personally believe in a God or something more than humans, but I do not see that God as 
interfering with the physics that has made the universe the way it is. Does that make sense? Sort of. <laughs> Yes, maybe say it so Newton, everybody can hear. About neutron stars generating gravitational waves. Right. Can you comment about it? Maybe I need to start by explaining gravitational waves. Um, please, will you stand still for a minute? Well, I use, the, use you as part of the demonstration. So <laughs> no, no, you'll do as a la stampa. Thank you very much. <laughs> so there is gravity attracting us too and there's gravity attracting you to us and you to each other. If I move and everybody else stays still, then the pattern of gravity, particularly the pattern of gravity between you and me, has changed. That change in the pattern of gravity is already traveling out through space at the speed of light, and you can't stop it or get it back. It's very, very, very small. But if I kept doing this, walking backwards and forwards, it would make a wave, and there's more chance that the wave would get picked up. So gravitational wave astronomy is looking for waves in the pattern of gravity caused by things moving. It's a very, very small wave. You need something really, really heavy, like a black hole, or maybe a neutron star, to make a change that we can measure. Uh, they have started detecting gravitational waves in 2017. Yes, last year, they found the gravitational waves from two pulsars, two neutron stars, moving around each other. But it's very, very weak. They had to measure a movement that was one million, million, millionth of a meter. So it's difficult work. They've taken 40 years developing the equipment, but they are now able to detect some of these gravitational waves from neutron stars. Yeah. A whole new spectrum is opening up, just beginning. Good evening. Uh, is there the possibility that one day a uh, pulsar will stop its spin? And what will, will happen in that case? Yes, I think there is a possibility because we can see them slowing. Um, we may not see it stop its spin, but we will see it stop being a pulsar, stop sending out radio waves when it gets really slow. But after that, it will presumably just slow and slow and stop. It will still have its gravity. It will pull things to it, but it will no longer spin. But that's a very, very long way ahead. And it will have stopped being a pulsar some time before that, because when the spin gets too slow, we believe they stop pulsing. What will be the final outcome of that? The final outcome will be a pulsar that sits there in space. It still has its gravity, so it pulls to it any atoms of gas that happen to come too close. It will get heavier and heavier over the eons, and perhaps one day will collapse to be a black hole when it gets too heavy for its own strength. I like to know uh, what happens in the mind of a graduate student that writes such a paper in uh, what happens in your mind to begin with you have to be very cautious test everything you can think of testing because this could be an artificial man-made signal and you will look very very stupid when that is discovered. 
So you have to be ultra cautious, do every test you can think of. And actually, for us, finding the second was even more important than finding the first, because it showed that there was another similar object, but with a slightly different period, slightly different beat rate. And then the third and the fourth, they are just the icing on the cake after that. So when you've just got one of something, it's very difficult to know what to do. You need more than one, really. Thank you. Abbiamo ancora qualche domanda, prego. Just a stupid question. Uh, this is a story of success, but what happened to a researcher if for five or six years doesn't find an interesting result? Mm -hmm. It will fill an application for another job? Yeah. Yes. Um, usually you can find something. This, of course, was really dramatic. Um, it's rare that research produces nothing. It might simply say, that method did not work. And that method did not work. But that is also useful information. That is also research. Um, I think that's probably the most I could say. But it, you hope that there is something interesting. And sometimes researchers will change to a different area or a different angle because the first one does not seem to be showing anything very useful. There are incidentally some stories of pulsars nearly being discovered. Um, every so often somebody comes up to me at the conference and says, you know, I nearly discovered pulsars, and tells me the story. And the one that I find most dramatic is way back from 1957, at an observatory in the United States. They were having an open night, and the telescope was set on the Crab Nebula, in particular that funny star in the middle of the Crab Nebula that we now know is the pulsar. And people stepped up to the telescope and said, ooh, cool and awesome, or whatever they said in 1957. And one young woman stepped up and said, that star's flashing. And the night assistant started to explain to her about stars twinkling. She stopped him. She said, no, I hold an airplane pilot's license. This is in 1957 and a young woman. She says, my job is to fly aircraft, new aircraft, from the manufacturer to the customer. I fly at night. I know about the stars because there's not much to do during the flight. I know about scintillation, that star's flashing. Now, the Crab Nebula Pulsar does give light flashes, flashes of light. They come at 30 hertz, 30 times per second. It used to be the case in Canada that the power supplies, the country's power supplies, were at 30 hertz, and some people could see the lights flashing. They subsequently changed to 60 hertz because some people were so troubled by these flashing lights. The crab pulsar also goes at 30 hertz. Some people can see it, especially women, especially young women. We now believe she saw it, but nobody bothered to follow up. If you find an anomaly, follow it up if you are a researcher. You never know where it goes. Grazie. Allora, prima di congedarci questa sera... Eh, oltre che ringraziare voi e la straordinaria lezione della professoressa, eh, lascio chiudere questa serata al professor Attilio Ferrari che 
ci racconta un'ulteriore iniziativa che sta per partire da infinito. Prego. Dunque, questa sera è stata dedicata, le pulsar sono il tempo, sono gli orologi, sono quello che ci permette di misurare il tempo. Eh, questa sera è in pratica l'inizio di una serie di conferenze che faremo in collaborazione con l'Accademia delle Scienze di Torino, eh, l'Istituto di Studi Umanistici, il Dipartimento di Studi Umanistici dell'Università di Torino, eh, che incomincerà il 26 di novembre, eh, nel pomeriggio, presso l'Accademia delle Scienze, in cui parleremo del tempo, veramente, di nuovo, il problema del tempo, non soltanto della misura, ma anche di quella che per noi è la sensazione del tempo. Quindi parteciperanno a questo tipo di conferenze eh, non soltanto scienziati, non soltanto fisici o astronomi, eccetera, ma ci saranno anche eh, neurobiologi, ci saranno musicisti, come sapete bene la musica è uno degli elementi, la, il tempo è proprio l'essenziale della musica, eh, ci saranno dei, eh, come si dice, dei letterati che vi parleranno anche del, del modo di vedere il tempo eh, in funzione anche dell'economia no? e di tutti questi aspetti. Quindi siete invitati, sarà, incomincerà l'Accademia delle Scienze nel pomeriggio del 26 di novembre. In particolare eh, su Infinito farà una conferenza dedicata proprio all'evoluzione del tempo in cosmologia, no? Dal, nella serata del 27 di novembre su in planetario, su al, di fianco all'osservatorio, no? su Apino Torinese. Sarà dedicata appunto, ci sarà una tavola rotonda, alcune delle persone che parleranno sono qui presenti, saranno persone dell'Università di Torino. Cercheremo di capire questo problema del tempo che sappiamo misurare, come ci ha spiegato la professoressa Bell, ma eh, diciamo quale sia la vera sensazione, ciascuno la propria sensazione del tempo è molto diverso no? da, da una persona all'altra e da un momento all'altro. No? Quando siete con una bella ragazza si dice il tempo passa molto in fretta, quando invece dovete fare un compito in classe non passa mai. Insomma. Quindi buona serata a tutti, grazie infinite per essere stati qui presenti e grazie alla professoressa. Grazie. Grazie. Grazie.